It would be nice if the wavelength of light coming out of an LED was just one fixed number. But it has a width, and that width is a consequence of how energy of carriers is distributed. And that depends on temperature, but we operate typically at room temperature, which is significant enough to give the output a quite a width. So let's go back to something we talked about in chapter one to understand why that is. And if you want to, you could just pause and go back and look at problem 1.7 that you did for homework. In that problem, we took the derived density of states, the expression that we derived in class for uh, conduction band and valence band densities of states, where remember they have to go to zero at the band edge. We were able to answer the question of what's the most likely energy that a charge carrier has. And in order to do that, we had to consider not just the density of states, but the occupation probability. The, the density of states just tells you the number of states available at a given energy. And something that's worth pausing for a second talking about on this graph is I understand it, it can be difficult to read because the ordinate and abscess are, are switched, right? The ver independent variable is vertical. The dependent variable is horizontal. But you just have to work with that because we like it that way so that we can superimpose this function on top of the energy band diagram. At a given energy, you can just go over here and read how many states are available. These states aren't filled. If they were, that would mean that at, at infinite energy, you have an infinite number of electrons, which, of course, is absurd. We need to account for the probability that each one of these states is occupied. And for that, we turn to the Fermi-Dirac distribution, which in Chapter 1, I introduced it to you and then modified it to account for the fact that the Fermi energy is inaccessible when it's inside the band gap. And so we had to have, we had to have the occupation probability cut off inside the band gap. So we kind of modified the shape. I don't know if these curves are quite shaped right, but sort of shaped right. Probably not quite as sharp as they're shown here. Now let me ask you to use your imagination and consider what happens when these two functions are multiplied together. Can you picture it? It'll look like this. Right? You have a, some energy level where the product of the two functions has a peak and then it goes back down to zero because Fermi Dirac distribution is going to zero and here it goes to zero because density of states goes to zero. But there's a energy worst maximum and in this problem 1.7 you found the energy where the number of carriers is the largest and you found that it was that the gap energy plus half a kT. And so if we looked at the effective band gap uh, where an electron has to go from an occupation in the conduction band to a vacancy in the valence band, it's going to have to not jump down the energy gap, but has to jump down the energy gap plus kT, assuming it's the same kT down there, which it turns out to be. The photon emitted has an energy that's not equal to the band gap, but it's actually a little bit larger. We typically ignore that fact because the gap, E sub G is typically, you know, 1 or 2 electron volts and KT is 0.026 electron volts, but it's there. Especially when it comes to lasers, you can't ignore it. And when considering the width of the light spectrum coming out of an LED, you can't ignore it. This, in fact, is the reason for it. If I looked at the energy of all the photons coming out of an LED, the most commonly seen energy will be not the gap energy, but the gap energy plus kT. So we'll call kT delta E. It's the spread in energy. It's actually half the spread in energy of emitted photons. Uh, a bunch of them have an extra kT, but then there are also these guys out here. And so I'll draw a picture of the, the spectrum in a second here. If the delta E, this spread in energies is kT, we need to turn it into something that's more practical for an experimentalist. We need to turn it into a width of wavelengths, you know, delta lambda. The spectral output of the LED, you know, goes from the so many nanometers to so many nanometers. That's a more practical question. How do you do that? And the rest of this video is devoted to answering how that's done. You have an expression that relates energy and lambda. HC over lambda is energy, or rather Lambda is HC over energy. Remember, HC is just 1,240 electron volt nanometers. It's a fundamental constant. Lambda and energy are related that way. So if I have delta E of kT, what's delta lambda? Is it HC over kT? No. You, you know, those are deltas, so take a derivative. So you have dE by d lambda is minus HC over lambda squared. Do you see that from this expression? If you 
uh, take this expression and differentiate dE by d lambda. Do you get that? Pause if you need to to, to see that that's so. I'm going to ignore the minus sign here simply because these are, are like widths, dE and d lambda. And a negative width makes no sense. Right? All the minus sign is telling me is that a graph of energy versus lambda has a negativity to it. But it's not um, physically meaningful when I start talking about how wide is the line in energy versus how wide is line lambda. So just take these delta lambda and delta energies to be magnitudes. That's all this is, is a rearrangement of this expression. Replacing the d's with deltas and rearrange the expression. So the width of the line in lambda is lambda squared times this width in energy over hc. That's the expression we will go with for lambda. I'll just replace it with hc over energy. So lambda squared is replaced with hc over energy squared, where the energy is, we'll just use the dominant energy, the most likely energy, energy gap plus kt. Replace delta e with kt and simplify. And we have an expression for the spectral width of an LED. These are all constants, hc and k, Planck's constant, Boltzmann's constant, speed of light, and then temperature. So if you take away temperature, there will be no width. That's why it's called thermal broadening, because the temperature does it to us. So let's, let's look at what the output spectrum should look like given our pictures from the previous slide. So this is the intensity coming out of an LED versus wavelength. Now dominant wavelength is HC over E gap plus KT. You cannot have a wavelength longer than HC over E gap. That is, you can't have an energy smaller than E gap. And it'll be a little asymmetric because it has to be a hard cutoff right there at HD over E gap. But there's no hard cutoff at, at the upper end, so there'll be a tail on the upper end. But the full width at half maximum is essentially given by delta lambda on either side. So we'll say that the width of this peak, the full width at half maximum of this peak, is approximately 2 delta lambda. And so there's the expression we have for delta lambda again. Just put the 2 in front of it. Let's put in some numbers. So 1240 for HC and 0.026 for KT. I'm going to make a, a commonly done but questionably valid approximation, which is to ignore this 0.026 in the denominator. And the reason why it's questionably valid is because, you know, E sub G energy gap is typically on the order of 1 EV. And like silicon is 1.12 EV. So you're ignoring something that's, that's about 2% of that number. If you needed something precise, you might want to keep that. But when we're talking about LEDs with really wide spectral bandwidths, it's not the most important thing to keep. Uh, and when you start talking about uh, ultraviolet LEDs, LEDs that are associated with large band gaps, it does become negligible. 64 is what it all comes out to, or E gap squared. So we just throw in some numbers for silicon. Uh, 1.12 EV, so delta lambda, just plug it in, you'll get 51 nanometers, which, you know, because we're talking about a width, delta lambda, of a of a already skewed a asymmetric curve, it's just rounded up for, for most, most people. Uh, most people are happy just saying it's 60 nanometers. I, I would also point out that if you did keep the 0.026 in this calculation, you just go ahead and check, you get 49. It's not that, that negligible. In practical cases, 60 is what gets used for the, the width of uh, an LED at room temperature, for the thermal broadening of an LED at room temperature. I'll stop it with uh, that.